Let's review Paul and his life to this point. So far we have seen that he's been, when he first appears, converted on the road to Damascus. He becomes a zealous follower of Christ. He receives a special revelation from the Lord that becomes the driving force of his life. And he starts churches in many places. To this point in our study, he has written two letters to the church in Thessalonica. One to the churches in Galatia, two to the church in Corinth, and one to the church in Rome. Paul arrives in Jerusalem in Acts 21, 15 through 26, and he is warned by the brothers in chapter 21, verses 20 through 25. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, or live according to their customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. People were saying that Paul had turned completely against the Jewish faith, and he's in real trouble. There's also four men who have taken a vow and the church leaders decide it would be a good idea if Paul joins with them. Apparently this is some kind of temporary Nazarite vow, and the basis for that is in number 6, verses 4 through 12, if you want to look that up. But apparently they had had some contact with dead body of an animal or something and had become ritually unclean, and so the way to get started in purification rite was to shave their heads. And so Paul was going to join in them with this. However, their plan backfires, and he's seized in the temple by Jews from Asia and accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. And the penalty of doing that was death. It was actually written. There was a sign outside the courtyard of the temple in Greek that couldn't bring outsiders in under penalty of death. In 21, 27, and 28, it says, When seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us. This is a man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place, and besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. So here, because he has done this, the crowd is ready to kill him. Of course, the Romans don't like disturbances. So Claudius Lysias arrests him for disturbing the peace. This is in 2133. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that kept that followed kept shouting, Away with him! And then in 37, it says, As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. And having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. We see that Paul uses his citizenship wisely in 22 verses 24 and 25. It says the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? 
So here they stop because he's a Roman citizen. Claudius still tries to find out why he is accused, and then Paul makes his defense before the Sanhedrin in Acts 23, 1 through 11. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I fulfilled my duty to God and all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priests? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was a high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees, and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that they are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And by the way, you may remember this from our study of the Pharisees and Sadducees earlier in the term. So Paul does this on purpose because he knows it will start a fight. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. After Paul makes his defense before the Sanhedrin, uh, gets them into an argument almost torn to pieces, Jesus appears to him and tells him that he is going to testify in Rome as well. Then there's a conspiracy to kill Paul. This is in 23, 12, and 13. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. This is serious. That they're taking an absolute fast until they kill him. They really wanted him dead. Paul's nephew finds out about this, and he tells the commander, Claudius Lysias, and then Paul is transferred for his own safety from Jerusalem to Caesarea by the sea. And you can see the map here where he has moved um, a pretty long way. They're serious about protecting him. So this is something where his Roman citizenship really came in handy. Essentially, he's under protective custody now. Eventually, Paul moves all the way to Rome, and you can see that down here is uh, Caesarea by the sea, and so Paul moves all the way over here through a shipwreck, and finally makes it on to Rome. First, Paul has moved 100 miles to Caesarea, that's uh, 23 and 24. 470 soldiers accompanied him, so they really wanted him to be safe. It was an overwhelming show of force. Claudius Lysias sent a letter to the Roman governor Felix. This is in 23, 26 through 30. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency Governor Felix, Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So it's interesting that Claudius actually here kind of... Mm, fudges with the details a little bit and makes it sound a little better than it was. He found out he was a Roman citizen, so he rescued him. It didn't quite work out like that, but oh well. Five days later, he has a, a hearing before Felix, and that is in Acts 24, 1 through 27. The Jews come up with accusations, and this is in verse 5. 
We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. And then Paul's defense, he says that he is not, he was not causing trouble. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. He also says that he is a Christian. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Felix decides to wait to make a decision and places Paul under house arrest. And that is verses 22 and 23. And then he speaks to Paul from time to time for two years. Really, he's hoping for a bribe from Paul so he can be released. But he also kept Paul as a favor to the Jews. Felix is then replaced by Festus. This is Acts 25, 1 through 22. And here the Jews present charges again while Festus is on tour in Jerusalem. And the Jews try to get him to bring Paul so they can ambush him in verse 2. Paul denies the charges. Festus wants a trial in Jerusalem to appease the Jews, but Paul refuses to go back to Jerusalem because he knows if he goes back there, they're going to kill him. So he appeals to Caesar. So this is 9 through 12. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has a right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Then King Agrippa visits Festus to welcome him as a new governor. That's in chapter 25, verses 13 through 22. Paul makes his defense before Agrippa from 25, 23 to 26, 32. Part of this, I think, is kind of humorous, so I want to read it to you. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray God not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. So even Paul making a defense and as a prisoner is still sharing the gospel. Paul is then sent to Rome. This is Acts 27 and 28. And this is in first person, so Luke is actually with him. They are going by ship, and they intended to go to Phoenix, but instead they went to Malta. And in Acts 27, 9, Paul predicts that disaster. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our lives also. But they didn't listen to him, and the shipwreck is detailed in Acts 27, 14 through 44. They arrive at Malta, washed up on shore, and this is verses 1 through 10. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed all welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. 
When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, a chief official to the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hand on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. Now there's a little change in Greek there and that indicates that Luke the physician was actually treating him or treating the people they brought to him. They honored us in many ways and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So the people on Malta were very kind to Paul and Luke. Paul arrives in Rome in 28, 11 through 31. He's under house arrest there for two years. And it is from here that he writes the prison letters. Acts ends very abruptly in eight, uh, 28, 30, and 31. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are a few possibilities here. Maybe this is all that had happened at the time Luke was writing. Paul hadn't appeared before Caesar yet, so there was nothing else to write. It could be that after two years, Paul appeared before Caesar and was acquitted and went on with more travel and more evangelism. Or it could be that Paul appeared before Nero, and who was the emperor at this time, and he was sentenced to death for treason and was beheaded. So maybe it is that Luke didn't record that because he didn't want to discourage the church. The prison epistles, or the prison letters, are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And they are so titled because Paul wrote them while he was in prison, or under house arrest. Paul actually talks about his chains, and they could be symbolic of his imprisonment, or they could be literal. I mean, he could have literally been chained to a guard, which was done during this time. He talks about the change in Ephesians 3, 1, Philippians 1, 7, Colossians 4, 3, and Philemon, verse 10. Philemon only has one chapter, so there's no chapter designation. It's very short. It's a personal letter. Let's look at just one example of that, which is Philippians 1, 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Paul endured more suffering than is recorded in the book of Acts. In 2 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 27, he details some of the things that have happened to him. Are they servants of Christ? Am I out of my mind to talk like this? I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Clement of Rome actually mentions seven imprisonments of Paul. Acts only record, records three of those in Philippi, in Caesarea, and in Rome. So, in any case, Paul endured a great deal of hardship. Paul was probably under house arrest in Rome since this is the earliest church tradition. Let's talk about Ephesians now. The author is Paul. Remember, he spent three years there, and yet 
It would seem that it would be a personal letter, but it's not. It's very impersonal. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. Surely you have heard? That seems very impersonal for someone who was there that long. There's also a lack of personal greetings. And the reason for this may be that Paul was in Ephesus for a long time, and he was not only sharing with people in Ephesus, but they were taking the message of the gospel and starting churches out away from there. So it may be that this was written and intended to be circular, and that would explain why there's not a lot of personal uh, nature to it. It's very similar to Colossians. One quarter of the material in them is the same. His treatment of family, slaves, and the church are the same. The, debate, the, the, date, the date depends on where he was. If he was in Rome, it was written 62 or 63 both Ephesians and Colossians mention Tychius, that's 621, and Colossians 47. So it may be that he is delivering both of these letters. They were written around the same time, which would explain how, why they have so much material in common. The destination is Ephesus, or that region of Asia Minor. The city of Ephesus is very important in Asia Minor, that's modern-day Turkey. It had a harbor that opened into the Caister River, which also ran into the Aegean Sea. It was an intersection of the major trade routes and had a harbor, so it was a very important commercial center. And the temple of the goddess Artemis, that Latin Diana, was there. And you, you may remember we talked about Paul's problems there and uh, the riot that happened, but he was there for three years. The church in Ephesus is actually warned in John's vision in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. The occasion and purpose is different from the other letters in that there's no specific problem. But he addresses the mystery of the body, the church. And the theme is that followers of Christ are heirs of God's blessing. The doctrinal section is in 1 through 3. He talks about the wealth of Christians in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. He gives the spiritual blessings given in Christ. Then there's a prayer that the believers there might have a full understanding of the divine resources available to them. And then the wealth of Christians is chapter 2, verse 1, to chapter 3, verse 13. There he discusses being transported from spiritual death to experience spiritual life. And he says that all comes through God's grace. And this is chapter 2. Verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Beautiful verses. The doctrinal section, and there's a prayer. In chapter 3, 14 through 21, he prays that they will be strengthened with the might of God's Spirit and know the dimensions of divine love. The practical section is chapters 4 through 6. This is the walk of the Christian, and he calls for a practical response to the blessings he had outlined in the first three chapters. He says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you had received. He encourages his readers to demonstrate a new attitude in their ministry in the church. Their walk was to show unity. Chapter 4, verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He talks about a proper use of spiritual gifts in 7 through 11. But to each of you, I'm sorry, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, He ascended on high. He led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he descended into the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended, higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be prophets, apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers 
to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. He also talks about Christian maturity in 12 through 16. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He also urges them to show a new relationship to one another and to walk in love and light. This is in 426. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not, let, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And 525. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And verse 33. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. We also can compare that with Galatians 3.28, which says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so uh, Paul is really bringing some revolutionary teaching um, about there being no distinction. He also addresses parents and children in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy a long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And in chapter 6, he urges them to prepare for spiritual warfare. That's in Chapter 6, verse 12.